Today we're out here near Welsh's Oregon looking at the all-new 2018 Audi SQ5. I haven't had a complete week to test the SQ5, of course, because we are driving this at an Automotive Video Association event. And that's exactly how I was able to get my hands on this vehicle back to back with the all-new 2018 Volvo XC60 T8, as well as the all-new Mercedes-Benz GLC 43 AMG. You'll find those videos either coming soon or on my channel already, but in the meantime, let's dive right into the Q5. This may look an awful lot like the outgoing Q5 model, but it's actually an entirely new car. That's because Audi, like many luxury manufacturers, prefers style evolution to style revolution. So we get a version of the same grille that we see on the other Audi models. It's a little bit larger and a little bit angrier up front, and we get full LED headlamps over here on either side. Audi continues to put their all-weather lamps inside the same headlamp module so we don't find fog lamps lower on the bumper. Instead, we find functional grill openings that relieve pressure up front, improve aerodynamics, and it actually exits the air right here in the front wheel well. The model that we're looking at right now is the SQ5, which is the performance version of the Q5. This gets a twin-turbo V6 engine under the hood. Most models you'll find on the lot will have the four-cylinder turbo. Expect a full review on the four-cylinder turbo coming up very soon, because I'll actually have it the week that I get home from driving this. In terms of overall length, the model we're looking at is 183.9 inches long. That's a hair longer than the regular Q5, because we are in the SQ5 model. That's also about an inch longer than the last generation Q5 because generally models seem to grow year after year. This is right about the same size as the brand new GLC or the brand new Volvo XC60. The Q5 is of course Audi's middle child crossover. This slots right between the smaller Q3 and the larger Q7. This is a two row crossover. Like other Audi crossovers, they have a very distinctive style going on right back here. And that's because as we'll take a look at in a bit, the rear tail lamp modules are entirely on the hatch. They're not on the body of the vehicle. And that means that when we open the car, the tail lamp modules go with it. Out back, the restrained styling continues, looking very similar to the other Audi crossover models and the previous generation Q5, but you can tell that things have definitely been sharpened up and freshened. On the driver's side, we have the very distinctive progressive Audi turn signal lamp. Now it looks amber on the camera, but it's actually red. It's just the way the camera deals with colors and those LEDs as they light up. Right down here, we have quad faux exhaust. These are actually not true exhaust tips. This is the same sort of thing that we recently saw on a number of crossovers in our channel. The real exhaust tips are entirely below the rear bumper. There's actually no hole in this lower section at all. For 2018, there are two engines under the hood of the Q5. Things start out with a two liter four cylinder turbo producing 252 horsepower. We have a complete review on that Q5 model coming up soon on our channel. If you want more power, the SQ5 gets a turbo V6 engine that produces 354 horsepower. That's good enough to get this vehicle up to a manufacturer quoted 5.1 seconds 0 to 60. Both engines are mated to a standard Quattro all-wheel drive system, but they actually use different transmissions. The 2-liter turbo engine is mated to a 7-speed dual-clutch transmission, basically the same one that we see in the Audi A4 and the Audi A5, whereas this turbo V6 gets a traditional 8-speed automatic. As we see with essentially every Audi vehicle that uses a longitudinally mounted engine, the entire engine is entirely in front of the front axle. But Audi has done an incredible amount of work in order to try and shift as much weight as possible to the rear of the vehicle, and the engine is positioned as close as possible to the front axle. And that improves the weight balance in this vehicle versus the last generation model. Front seat comfort comes in at 9 out of 10 points in the SQ5 that we're testing here. These seats feature a four-way adjustable lumbar support as well as a manually extending thigh cushion and four-way adjustable headrests. You will find more comfortable seats in certain versions of the Volvo XC60. However, the XC60, even in the T8 form, is not quite a direct competitor to the SQ5. These are just about as comfortable as the seats that we find in the brand new Mercedes-Benz GLC 43. The tilt telescopic steering column is a manually adjusting model and we have a two-position seat memory for the driver. A nice touch in this cabin is that the passenger seat has exactly the same range of motion as the driver's seat. Moving to the back, I'm going to give rear seat comfort 8 out of 10 points. We do find a little bit less room in the Q5 than in the brand new Volvo XC60. It's noticeable both in the rear legroom score and in the rear headroom score. We are in the model with the optional panoramic sunroof, and my hair is barely brushing the ceiling, but I still have about an inch between my actual head and the ceiling top. If I move over to the middle seat, there's plenty of room, and I actually get a little bit more headroom just because of the overall design of the ceiling. Moving over to the right side of the vehicle, the difference in legroom is noticeable. This front seat is all the way back in its tracks like it was in the Volvo, but my knees are touching the rear seat back. 
As we find with many European vehicles, the rear seats do fold in a 40-20-40 fashion that makes it considerably more practical for cargo carrying capacity than the average mainstream crossover. The 20% section folds independently of the 40% side on the driver's side, but if you fold the 40% side, both sides do go with it. Rear passengers also get a fold-down center armrest with two cup holders. Behind the hatch, we find 26.8 cubic feet of cargo space. You'll notice this is a little bit lower than your average non-luxury compact crossover that's about the same size. And that all has to do with the ability to hold the engine that we find in something like the SQ5 and the fact this has a rear wheel drive power bias. That does take up extra room under the hood, and that means that we get a little bit less storage space back here than you'll find in a mainstream crossover. But at 26.8, this is still more than we find in some of the competition, although it is just a little bit below the brand new XC60. Under the load floor, we find a rarity in the luxury segment, an actual spare tire, although this is one of the inflatable variety. So you notice it is very compact right here. The rim is actually right over here, and the end of the tire is there. That's not how it would look when you put it on the car. In order to actually use this spare tire, we would further lift up the load floor, pull out this tire inflator right over here on the side, and then this tire would actually become several inches larger. These are not quite as usable as regular compact spare tires, but it's better than not having a spare at all. Taking a closer look at the left side of the cargo area, we have latches to release the rear seat backs from back here. That's kind of a handy feature, although you can only release them from the back. You cannot release them from the seat itself. We also have buttons down here to raise or lower the vehicle if you get the optional air suspension. Unfortunately, we did not have enough time with the SQ5 to film its interior, so we are now inside a regular Q5. The SQ5 is substantially similar, but I'll point out the differences, of course. This model has the optional large panoramic moonroof, which goes right back there to just over the rear passenger's heads. The seats are very similar in this model, but of course the SQ5 did have that extending fine cushion, which this particular trim does not. The front door panels are made from almost entirely soft touch plastics, as you'd expect out of a vehicle in this category. The wood trim available in our Q5 model right here is replaced with a metal trim in the SQ5. The dashboard in both models is dominated by the large Audi MMI screen, and this does support Apple CarPlay because it's the latest version of MMI, although we don't find a touch screen in the Q5 or SQ5. Below that, we have the controls for the three-zone climate control system. If you want to control the zone in the rear, we toggle this right down here to set rear, and then you can use this knob to set the rear climate zone. Below that, we have the controls for the Audi Drive Select system. This allows us to change the way the different aspects of the vehicle's suspension, engine, and drivetrain work. We have an auto start stop button, traction control button, parking sense enable disable, hill descent control of course, and then a button to turn on and off the MMI screen. There's a small storage cubby right there. I was not able to put a large smartphone in it. We have a power button for the engine, and then the Audi MMI controls. These are a little bit different in this version of MMI because we now have a touchscreen interface, although the familiar Audi rotary dial is still there. Audi still places the track forward, backward, and volume knob over here on the passenger side. That could be a little bit less convenient than some vehicles out there because it is easy for the passenger's knee to bump that control. We then have a toggle shifter right here in the center of the console pull back for the drive, toggle once back for the sport mode, manual mode is over to the right, we toggle away from the driver for gear up, pull towards the driver for gear down. Between the front seats we have a padded center armrest that slides forward and backward and ratchets into position for taller drivers. If we lift it up out of the way we find a small storage divider right here which slides forward and backward. You can almost put an iPhone 7 Plus in there. This is where you find the two USB inputs, auxiliary input, and probably some of the best cup holders we find in any Audi model. Looking at this image, you'll see the biggest differences between the Q5 and the SQ5. We have the carbon fiber trim on the dashboard instead of real wood trim. The LCD instrument cluster gets a slightly different layout, although you can still minimize the tachometer that you're seeing here in the center, and then you'll get the moving map display over the entire LCD. We then have a flat bottom sport steering wheel with basically the same controls that we find in the regular Q5. Audi then puts suede inserts on the front door panels, and then if we move down to the seats, you'll see the extending thigh cushion and the quilted leather in the center of the seat. I'm sorry about the voiceover. We had a corrupt video file and we didn't catch it until we were back home. So let's just dive right into the numbers here. Acceleration happened in 5.1 seconds in the SQ5, which is exactly what Audi quotes. However, in order to get that time, we did have to brake torque the engine, something that we didn't have to do in the GLC 43 AMG or in the Volvo XC60 T8. If you don't brake torque the Audi, then it takes about two to three tenths of a second longer to get from zero to 60. That surprised us a little, so hopefully we'll be able to get the Audi, the BMW, the Volvo, and the Mercedes back home to do our official zero to 60 tests on them and see who comes out on top. 
However, it's important to remember that the SQ5 is heavier than the GLC 43 AMG, so the slower 0 to 60 time actually does make sense. Also keep in mind we were driving a fully loaded SQ5 with options like the panoramic moonroof and the adaptive air suspension and those all add weight. When it came to braking, the extra weight wasn't really noticeable however because we stopped from 60 miles an hour back to zero in a very short 110 feet. That's five to six feet shorter than the regular Q5 even though this is heavier. For a crossover, handling is absolutely excellent. BMW for some reason declined to provide their new X3 for back-to-back -back testing, so I'll reserve that from commenting here just a little bit and instead focus on the Volvo and the Mercedes that we were able to drive back-to-back. -back. The GLC 43 AMG is much more of a direct competitor than the Volvo. The XC60 is definitely more on the comfort side of the spectrum than on the sport side of the spectrum. The SQ5 compares very well to the GLC, but the Mercedes does feel more nimble and more responsive. Some of that may have to do with the fact that it's about 300 pounds lighter than the Audi, but some of it also has to do with the way that the Mercedes has been tuned. The GLC also has a more noticeable rear wheel drive power bias than we find in the SQ5. That's not too obvious in most driving situations, but if you do start pushing either the SQ5 or the GLC harder, then you will start noticing the difference. When it comes to our overall handling score, I'm going to have to give the SQ5 an A- because it does fall just below the new GLC 43 AMG. The SQ5 is certainly no slouch when it comes to handling and it really shows that Audi has spent a great deal of time moving weight to the rear of the vehicle and turning the SQ5 into a vehicle that can definitely target the brand new BMW X3. Unlike previous generations of the Q5 or even the SQ5, when you start pushing this vehicle in the corners in neutral handling situations, it doesn't feel as front heavy as previous generations did. I'm going to give the ride score a B-, even with the optional adaptive air suspension, the SQ5 is going to be firmer than the regular Q5 and it is noticeable out on the road, especially if you start driving on services that are a little less than perfect. While the Audi shines over the Volvo in handling, the Volvo XC60 certainly delivers a softer ride if you equip it with the optional air suspension. In terms of cabin noise, we haven't had a chance to officially test them, but the SQ5's cabin is a quiet place to be and the engine sounds are definitely pleasing. The cabin was a little bit louder than the Mercedes, but quieter than the Volvo. According to the EPA, the SQ5 is rated for 17 city, 24 highway, and 21 combined. And you'll definitely consume more fuel than the regular Q5. You'll also drink slightly more than the GLC 43 and notably more than the hybrid Volvo in normal driving. BMW has yet to officially release fuel economy figures on the X3 M40i, but I would be surprised if it was that much more efficient. In our tests, we were averaging around 18 miles per gallon, but keep in mind that we were driving the vehicle pretty hard. It's also worth noting that although the Volvo hybrid system will get significantly better fuel economy in normal driving, Producing 350 to 400 horsepower takes a certain amount of fuel. So if you're aggressively driving your vehicle, the XC60 T8 is going to get about the same kind of fuel economy as we find in the SQ5. For a compact luxury crossover, 21 mpg is not exactly unexpected. However, I'm going to have to give this a B- when it comes to fuel economy because there are more efficient options out there. For 2018, Audi has priced the SQ5 starting at $54,300. As we've been driving it here, $65,000 total. That's about $12,000 more expensive than a base Audi Q5 for 2018, which would be the 2-liter 4-cylinder version. The price difference buys you not only the extra power, but also the extra handling ability that we see in the SQ5 version. This compares fairly well to the Mercedes competition and, of course, the Volvo that we have also recently reviewed, which came in at $71,000 total. The Volvo appears to be more expensive than this, but it does qualify for a $5,000 federal tax credit that you don't get on the Audi, because, of course, this is not a plug-in hybrid and the Volvo is. Of course, rationally, that means that the Volvo is not a direct competitor to the Audi SQ5 because it has a very different mission in mind. This is a closer competitor to the Mercedes-Benz GLC 43 AMG than the Volvo XC60 T8. And that's important to keep in mind because the T8 version of the XC60 comes across as a more comfortable, more luxurious vehicle. This is sporty, but not quite as comfortable. And it actually happens to be just a little bit slower than the hybrid system that we find in the Volvo. There's absolutely no question, however, if you're after one of the best corner carving compact luxury crossovers, look no further than the Audi SQ5. It also happens to be well priced when you compare this to something like a Porsche Macan. The Porsche Macan will get you from 0 to 60 faster than the SQ5, but you will have to pay considerably more for it than this Audi. 
If you want to know more about the Q5, the SQ5, the Volvo XC60, or the all-new Mercedes-Benz GLC 43 AMG, be sure and subscribe to this channel. Check out our related videos because we will have complete video reviews on those models coming up very soon.